Shalom and welcome everyone to today's program. I'm excited about today's program and firstly, thanking uh, Dr. Brooke Corman for joining me all the way from Israel. Welcome today, Brooke, to today's discussion. Shalom, Christian. Good to see you in uh, Australia. How are things in uh, Israel at the moment? I hear that uh, there's certain restrictions and flights not going in route. Uh, a few days ago, they closed the airport for approximately six days. They're talking about extending that perhaps even up to a month, which I find hard to believe, but we'll see. We've been locked down for four weeks, and uh, the Knesset is debating whether to extend it another week or so. So things have been uh, fairly close here. Very interesting times, aren't they? So today, uh, the message for today and the discussion that we'll be holding today is the warning against deception. Um, a very, very relevant topic for these days, not only because of what we've seen in the U.S. with uh, many so-called prophets claiming that uh, God has spoken to them prior to the election, but also on another uh, flip side as well, just general ministries that uh, leaving the election side that sadly are really being used by the enemy, in my humble opinion, uh, deceiving people in a way that we've never seen before. So I thank you, Baruch, for your time today as we're going to explore quite a few scriptures and we're going to dwell into them very, very quickly. But just before we kick off, I just wanted to talk about the word deception because a lot of people that I speak to that uh, sadly follow some of these ministries they actually tell me, no, but they, they actually say so many good things and they teach so many good scriptures. But that's the thing about deception. They'll, they'll, they'll throw a lot of good things in there, but some of the teachings or doctrines or things that they do are, are outright blasphemous. And when I was reading this uh, in the Hebrew, I looked at very interestingly that the word deceived that Moses used in this warning is the Hebrew word patah which is often translated to entice, to persuade, to allure, or to deceive. Equally important in the Greek, um, it says that there are several words in the Greek New Testament that um, are translated to deceive in English, but the most common one used is planel, meaning to go astray, to wander off course, to deviate from the correct path, uh, to roam into error, and to be misled. So can you just... Briefly touch on that, Baruch, in terms of, I mean, would you agree with that, with my comments that a lot of these ministries that are deceiving people, that they do use some correct scripture and doctrine, but then some of what they preach and teach is totally blasphemy. Well, there's an old uh, adage that says, just a little bit of arsenic will ruin a perfectly good meal. So obviously, we know that Satan going all the way back to the garden he, he spoke about the word of God. He simply twisted it. And you make a very good point about this Hebrew word for deception relating more to enticing. And here's what we learned. When we are pursuing our agenda, that gives the enemy a stronghold to entice us. And when we are following that which entices us, the outcome of that is that deception. And that's why I hear so frequently. Uh, there's one individual, and he gave a prophecy last fall in 2019, not 2020, so I guess a little bit over a year ago, prophesying how the year 2020 was going to be the year of the church, that, that the church would make great inroads, that people, even the non believers would have to say that, that, that Christ is on the throne, that he is making a mark and such. Well, it's interesting, but I would not think that most people would call 2020, the year of the coronavirus, a, a time where the church, church really took a step forward and, and had a, a greater degree of, of credibility within, within the world. I didn't see it the way that he said it. All times, these, these so-called prophets, they only have good words to say. Certainly. I, I agree with you 100% there. The, um, the other thing, just before we start looking at scriptures that I want to bring up, is that a lot of these people will say, uh, no, uh, we are prophets of God because, uh, as the Bible in the New Testament talks about the gifts of the Spirit, and one of them includes the gift of prophecy. 
So can you just share with us your views about the difference between the actual profits and in comparison to the actual gift of prophecy? Well, God can use anyone. We know in the Old Testament, in the book of uh, Numbers, we see that, that God got his word through a donkey. So God is, is free. He's sovereign. In these days, he can give a word of knowledge, a word of instruction, a prophetic word to whomever he wants to do that. But I think it's very dangerous when people start calling themselves prophets and apostles, because with that comes a degree of authority. Today, we know that when someone uh, speaks something, we need to check it with with the word of God. It says the words of the prophets are, are subjected to the prophets. Mm -hmm. One understanding of that is we have to check out what's being said by what the prophets of the scripture. And the prophets of the Bible were always 100% accurate. And I hear today people are growing into that, that, that calling of being a prophet. And that, that let that ministry flow through you and just, just say what you're feeling. This is not what the prophets did. They heard clearly the word of God. They spoke what God told them, not just what they were feeling, what they were sensing and such. And, and so often these so-called prophecies are so vague and they're reinterpreted later on to mean something quite different than you would think when you first heard it. So I am quite, quite skeptical, and I'm sure we're gonna get into some examples of this, but my hope would be this, that a, a mature believer would look at this and be able with discernment, we're supposed to have discernment, yes. easily be able to see that these so-called prophets of today, their lifestyle, their emphasis on wealth, their, their, their twisting of the word of God, their poor theology, it's obvious that, that this is not a movement of God. Correct. And I think from my point of view, I, I'd like to also reiterate that um, this is not about, because uh, believe it or not, I've had some people tell me that I'm just being negative, but it's not about being negative. It's about, you know, warning people of the deception that there is out there these days and how dangerous it is. I mean, when I look at uh, in Matthew chapter 24, in verses 4 and 5, Jesus twice warns us, his disciples, that there will be a time where deception will be offered by men. I mean, he tells us, take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name. And we'll look at that shortly. But it's about, I just want to set a precedent here that it's about a warning of the deception that we see in the world today that's increasing. And every time that, uh, to be honest with you, every time that I think, okay, I've seen it all. I've heard everything there is to hear with some of these false prophets, but yet the next day comes around and there's something far worse. And what's sad is that people are being deceived by this and they give their money to these ministries and they just, I, I really can't understand what's going on, but it's getting way out of control. I, I don't think it's an accident that the scripture that you quoted from Matthew 24 speaks about a increase in this deception through false prophets, false teachers, those who will be also false Christs. Mm -hmm. And it's a sign of the time that we're living in. It's an increase in these movements like the new apostolic reformation and such. Yes. Yes. They're, they're full of false teaching a, a, and not an accurate presentation of the word of God. And you'll see one of the things that, that a lot of false teachers will do is that you'll, you'll use various translations. Why? Because they're not going to the literalness of the scripture. They're seeking a translation, something to, to support what they want to say. And you'll find that more and more of them are using paraphrases for the, for the word of God rather than a literal translation, simply to find something that supports their interpretation rather than a clear rendering of the text. Uh, and exactly right, and Brooke, and sometimes, and, uh, and I make no apologies, but I will be mean, making mention of some of these uh, ministers or so-called prophets, but um, every time I see that there's a book deal behind it or they're promoting one of their new books, I always encourage people just be careful what you hear. 
go back to the word of God, like you've said before. I mean, the word of God is truth. It's eternal. Um, Jonathan Kahn, who has been known for giving a few false prophecies uh, lately, starting with the blood moons and other things that he's spoken about. I mean, when he brought out the first book called The Harbinger, and uh, then recently uh, The Harbinger 2, and he mentioned because God didn't allow him to release the second one until a specific period of time. I mean, I really don't understand how people can't see through that. Well, here in Israel, there's an organization and someone so-called had a prophecy and the head of the organization said as uh, they were speaking about this issue in a very different way. He said, you know, I know God, he said, I'm convinced that God gave this brother a word of God to share, but he said, I, I encourage him not to share it at that time because people might get the wrong impression. Now, this said a lot to me. He was just talking freely off the top of his head. But just think about this. God gives a word and says, share this word, supposedly. And someone else is saying, no, I want you to stop. To me, it just really manifested where they are when they believe that they know better than God. If God gave that word, why would you share it? And why would someone, not saying that he heard from God, say, no, I want you to stop. I don't want you to give it out yet later on. It's all putting ourselves above God and hearing and saying what we want rather than submissively looking at the best source of God's revelation. And that is, that is his scripture. Correct. Correct. So I'm going to start sharing the screen um, and we're going to start looking at uh, some of these scriptures that we want to be looking in in a deeper way. Um, so the first, or that, there's a few things. Why deception needs to be exposed. Uh, and then we'll look at the actual origins of deception because it's, it's always been with us, um, even from the Genesis. But I want to look at Romans 16, uh, verses 17 to 18. Uh, now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly and by smooth words, flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. Well, one of the things I would say here is that you see in that scripture where it says they serve their own belly. This mm -hmm. is idiom that they're doing things for themselves. They're not committed to, to the purpose of God. They're not committed to and the purpose of God relates to holiness. This is not their objective. Their objective is their own plan, their own, own desires. And as we said earlier, whenever I am about what I want, that is an invitation. It is a, a stronghold for the enemy to plant himself and move to deceive. And not just deceive me, but unfortunately use that person to deceive others. So we are called to, to notice Paul says, I urge you, we are called. It doesn't matter if it's popular, whether we're like, whether we'll be, what people will say about it. But we're all called to stand in opposition to that. And we see so frequently in the Old Testament how there was one prophet of God, but, but hundreds of false prophets. And it's these false prophets that, that had a strong connection with the government and the government being one that was opposed, one that was full of idolatry, how false prophecy, idolatry, and casting off restraint, a lack of justice was the outcome of all, all these things go together. Correct. I just want to briefly touch on Hebrews 1, verse 1 to 3. God at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Oh, I, I see the emphasis on the teachings of Messiah and how the mind of Messiah that as a believer we're supposed to have illuminates us in regard to the words of the prophets. So I think it's very dangerous 
that this new revelation, and, and you mentioned an individual a few minutes ago, and it's troublesome when everyone wants to sensationalize the scripture, wants to put everything in a package, uh, this is a mystery, uh, and they have catchy little terms for, for getting people to click on their video or to buy their book or order their CDs. It's all about marketing. I don't see too often in the scripture where, where God would send a PR man that there's advertising. The word of God in itself stands alone and it's either going to touch that inner man and, and that person is going to respond and, and submit to it or it's going to produce when they are confronted with truth, it's going to manifest a rebellious spirit. But I see so much marketing today among these so-called prophets. Correct. And you touched on something very important as well about the, how they sensationalize everything. And, you know, God doesn't need us to sensationalize anything. Um, and, and it also applies not only to these false prophets, but also to, I've noticed that people that are, uh, these radical people that preach on the pre-tribulation rapture. And look, if, if you've got that view and you've got some scriptures to support that, look, congratulations to them. That's my view. But to, they go to a point that they'll, they'll look at you. There's something seriously wrong with you. If you don't agree with their stance on pre-tribulation rapture, you know, I think that's very dangerous. It, it sets a precedent. And unfortunately, if they're wrong, people won't be prepared for what's to come. This is such a, a, a true statement about being prepared. And it's the word of God, prophecy in the scripture that has been given to believers, the body of believers, to prepare us for, for what's coming. Not, as you pointed out, not some sensational, nice marketed uh, presentation of something, but, but the word of God. And we are, we are in the midst of time of great deception. So I'm thankful for, for the issue of what we're talking about because I think it's, it's very, very pertinent for the days that we are approaching. And the last uh, scripture there I've got this part of the introduction is 1 Timothy 5.20. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the uh, rest also may fear. Uh, I only brought that up because some people that will always tell you you can't judge. And look, I understand about not judging individuals, but I'm looking at uh, people that are leading ministries that most of them, not all, but most of them know exactly what they're doing, uh, the sin that they're committing um, and deceiving people. So I just think that it's important that we have a responsibility as watchmen to actually expose these kind of things. And, and, and two issues here. There's a, a big difference between judging. The Greek word krino for judging has a sense of condemning. We're not about condemning other. God is the only one that, that has the authority to condemn. Correct. But there's a big difference between condemning and simply evaluating whether something is, is scripturally sound or not. And that's what that scripture is telling us, that we have a right to not condemn, but to rebuke. And the purpose, and I know your heart, Christian, the, the purpose that this subject came and your motivation for it was not to be a herald of condemnation, but, but to see people be confronted and hopefully repent and, and, and submit to the, the true manifestations of the Holy Spirit. We want to see all people be used by God for, for, for holiness, sanctification, righteousness, for, for edifying the body of believers. So we're not about condemning, but we do have, and that's a great scripture that you chose, we do have a, a God-given commandment and authority to rebuke those within the body that are not being sound in their, their proclamation of their views of what the scripture says. Great, thank you. So now we're going to uh, dwell in a little bit more. Um, I just thought I'd also put this scripture up here. Uh, uh, I didn't make you aware of this one, but Matthew eleven thirteen. 13. Uh, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Well, what's your interpretation of that scripture, bro? Well, here again, the law and the prophets doesn't mean that they're not relevant today. Mm. But what it said was 
that the law and the prophets were going to be foundational in preparing us for the ministry of, of the Messiah. So when it says until, in Hebrew, that word ad, until, just doesn't mean up to that point and then no more, but it comes into a, a certain uh, place, a certain time, and there it's merged with, with something else that becomes greater. So it has a purpose, but it could also be the foundation for, for something greater. So that's what we see here in Matthew 11. It's talking about uh, what, that the law and the prophets should, when we, when we understand them, it should prepare us for the ministry of John the Baptist, what he was saying, why he said it, and that should be a natural transition to understanding the days of Messiah, that the ministry of Messiah, the timing of that, what he was going to do, what he taught, all of that was coming into fruition at that time. The prophets and the law gave us indication of that. Great. Thank you. Um, just before I look at Matthew 7, I just want to touch on a little bit on Genesis 3, 4, just going a little bit off script here. But um, uh, when, when you look at Genesis 3, 4, then the servant said to the woman, uh, you will not surely die. And I just want to emphasize about the importance that deception has always been here with us. Can you just touch a little bit on that, Baruch? Well, of course, there's two different definitions of death, just like last night I was teaching on the second death. And we have that the physical death, but we also have the concept of a, a spiritual death, falling out of fellowship eternally with God. And, and so Satan, he emphasized one aspect, a worldly aspect. He totally set aside the intent. And so it's a mis, misrepresentation. And that's what Satan does when the scripture says he's the father of all lies. He wants to misrepresent. He wants to distort. He wants to conceal God's meaning in order that he can get us to do what he wants and it's so important here when we look at that context, what Satan wants us to do is always against what God has called us to do. And Satan, one of the ways that he's spoken of is the accuser. Mm. He delights, his motivation is to work in a person's life, that distortion, that, that lie, that deception, in order to bring them where he can accuse them so that they suffer the condemnation of God. He rejoices in seeing others suffer. And that's why this is so serious, because false prophets, they, they do the work of Satan. They are participants in the, objection, the objectives of Satan rather than in the purposes of God. Correct. And once again, before I move into Matthew a little bit further, I want to touch on another scripture in the Old Testament in Jeremiah 14, verse 14. I'll just read that very quickly. And the Lord said to me, the prophets prophesied lies in my name. I have not sent them, uh, commanded them, nor spoken to them. They prophesied to you a false vision, divination, a worthless thing, and a, the deceit of their heart. I think we're seeing a lot of that these days in terms of Every time you hear someone, thus says the Lord, and the Lord says this, not only that they've been proven to be false prophets, but we're seeing an increase of that. Do you think, Baruch, that Jeremiah 14, 14, we're seeing a lot of that these days as well? Uh, as you said, I, I did not know you were to pick that, that scripture, but I think it's highly, and I want to emphasize, highly appropriate for, for what the heart of God would say about the issue we're dealing with, this, this onslaught of false prophecies, those who elevate themselves by taking the title. You know, right there, I understand that the scripture says, for example, in Ephesians 4, there will be apostles and prophets and, and pastors and teachers and evangelists and people with this type of gift and such. But, but it's not about, you know, we're all brothers. When people are, are identifying themselves as an apostle, as a prophet, Usually, when that's so important to them, run away because these individuals are about exalting self and not uh, humbling themselves that the ministry and the anointing of the Holy Spirit can be, can be mediated through them 
for the purpose of truly blessing and encouraging and instructing and reproving others. So we see a real difference between the objective of a true prophet, how they thought of themselves, and, and one of these false prophets of today. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Now we uh, go back to Matthew 7, verse 15 to 16. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Well, here we see, again, this common tendency. You know, they want to devour the sheep. When we look, for example, in, in uh, Ezekiel, we see that same tendency among the, uh, they call them the Roim, the, the shepherds of Israel, the leadership of Israel, that instead of protecting and feeding and nourishing and leading the sheep to safety and maturity, they devour them. And this is what a false prophet does. He does not do ministry. He does not build up, but he wants to destroy. And the word that's so, so relevant devour. Mm. They're not about building up, being a blessing, growing people. They are tearing down and devouring. This is the, the, the big difference between a servant of God and a servant of the enemy. Correct. We, we touched on the, the scripture a little bit in, as part of the introduction in Matthew 24, 11, but then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Can you just elaborate your further comments on that, Baruch? As I mentioned, as we get closer and closer to the end times, this transition between this world and how it was to a change, and that change is going to be the establishment of that kingdom of God. So between those two, the kingdom of God and this world as it has been, the transition is the end times. And there's many things that characterizes the end times. One of which that Yeshua spoke of is this increase of false teachers and false prophets. And here again, it's going to lead to something. You know, Messiah says he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. Mm -hmm. So I'm here, and I'll, and I'll tell you what is truly a, a, a false prophecy. And that is, I hear a lot of, of these so-called prophets speaking about the word unity. Now, obvious, Christian, we want to be unified. In, in John chapter 17, for example, beginning in 16, actually, but the Messiah was speaking to disciples about us being one. So unity is important, but that unity is the outcome of submissiveness to the truth. Mm -hmm. The distortion, because we all would say unity is good, but what they're saying is we need to be unified. Don't, don't break the unity. We can, you know, agree to disagree. This is dangerous because we need to speak and pursue truth. And this movement of false prophecy really is an attack against truth. It goes right along with Pontius Pilate saying, what is truth? because it didn't serve his purpose. It didn't serve the things of the world. So when we use unity as a, a trump card to tolerate uh, uh, falseness, those things that are untrue, it's an invitation for the enemy to come and plant themselves within a local congregation, within a denomination, within a movement, within a fellowship. And that's exactly what happens. And there's manifestation of power. But the problem is the origin of that power is not the Holy Spirit. It is demonic. And we see, and we may get into this, but, but we see that there's manifestations of power that accompanies these prophets. Mm -hmm. But it's not the power of the Holy Spirit. Correct. Correct. And look, I remember David Wilkinson once said that uh, in the last days we're going to be seeing a gospel of compromise um, like you touched on that once again it's not only tickling the ears but going to a point where people will prefer to see not to offend people create that unity so that they don't get upset and then only the congregation so uh, we, we're definitely seeing that quite a bit Matthew 24 24 uh, also tells us that false 
For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Something you just briefly touched on as well. Some of these we've seen some manifestations, but we have to have that discernment. Is it really from the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Is, is it really from the Holy Spirit? And what is the edifying outcome? We know that the Holy Spirit, when we go back to Yeshua's teaching in John, John 15 and 16 and such, we see that fruit, the Holy Spirit, he, he convicts us of sin. He teaches us the way of righteousness. He leads us into truth. There is an edifying influence. One of the things that I, I, I really caution people on, if we see so-called manifestations of something for the sake of manifestation, for the sake of just seeing something supernatural, that is not of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit always produces fruit. And to see people simply on the ground, in pain, crying out, screaming, convulsion, and, and such, this is not edifying. This is clearly a manifestation of, of the fruit, not of the spirit, but of demonic influence. And we should be very concerned that this is being passed off today as the Holy Spirit and it's so sad that so much of, of the body of believers or church doesn't recognize this. And they don't see that the ones who are leading this, you go and they may be on the platform for an hour and a half. They say very little about the word of God. Very little. They use terms, legacy, impartation, and they just keep repeating it over and over. And, and this is an occult practice. Of, of putting someone, you know, just trying to program them. It's of the occult. It's not of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Correct. Correct. With catchy phrases. <clears throat> just want to look at First Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit expressively says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. That's basically what you were just touching on as well, isn't it, Baruch? That um, there are these false uh, teachings and doctrines of demons that people do not have that discernment that it really isn't the Holy Spirit. The word faith, now, of course, this would be in Greek, pistis, but in, in Hebrew, the word faith and truth comes from the same root. And so people are departing from the truth. And, and in, the, in the scripture, we know that this is a characteristic of the last days, and it's laying the foundation for the work of the Antichrist, who is his whole, I don't want to use the word ministry, but his whole work is going to be based upon signs and wonders. Now, this is a, a false, uh, uh, you know, we know that the Holy Spirit has signs and wonders, but this is a, a false or counterfeit image of that which is real. So we need to realize that the work of the Antichrist, and we know the scripture says, for example, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I believe verse 7, where it says the, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work in this world. And, and I think this is the key. False prophecy produces a lawlessness, a, a moving aside. And one thing I'll say is when you look at these prophets, so many come from an immoral lifestyle and not having come out, but they're still living in that mora immorality. Yeah. I know a situation, and it's fairly well known, that these so-called groups of prophets from uh, uh, places like Bethel and those that associates with that, in uh, California, mm -hmm. they, they put their stamp of approval on an individual, that he's an apostle, that he's going to have this great ministry. If you see how he was, was doing it, it's unbelievable to me that anyone could affirm him. But he was in the midst of adultery at that time. So it's questioning, it, it questions, a question arises, if there are prophets 
why would they put and not know that this person is an adulterer? Yes. Why, why did the Holy Spirit tell them that? Rather than saying, he's a great man of God, he's an apostle, he's a prophet, he's an emissary of the Holy Spirit. This is the, the disconnect. Correct. Second Timothy uh, chapter 4, verses 3 to 4. For the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. I think uh, just before I hand over to you, Brooke, with that, I think we've, we've touched on this a little bit in terms of itching ears, but I've come across this quite often now that sadly a lot of believers, they they don't, maybe because they don't read scripture the way they should, or um, they're not sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, but they're still praying and wishing that things are going to get so turned around in, in such a good way that it'll be a bed of roses for all believers around the world. While I agree that we need to pray for people that are in authority, that's contrary to scripture. As we're heading into the, the last days, prophetically, please correct me if I'm wrong, but things are supposed to get worse. Um, so I think that's where some of these ministries, they know that, but they don't want people to know the truth. And they just give them all these false doctrines and teachings that everything will be all right. Uh, God will do everything you want. It's like he's your own private genie. Uh, he'll give you this. He'll give you a car. He'll give you a house. It's all about now. But they don't think about eternity. Well, I, I, I strongly concur. We, we know that this dominion theology is very, very prevalent among the so-called prophets. Mm. And there's many aspects of that. But one is... If you look at a, large, a lot of these ministries that support it, they have a view that the world's going to get better, mm -hmm. that there's going to be, and they use this term, and they, they, they're great at, at using terms that do just what this passage from 2 Timothy 4 says, tickle ears. Mm -hmm. Now, if we talk about the term triumphant church, well, we would all agree that ultimately, ultimately, a kingdom experience, the church is going to be triumphant. Mm. But what they mean by that is that the church is going to be successful in converting this world and bringing about a change where things such as all the governments, mm. education, the arts, the entertainments, uh, everything is going to be converted over to that which is pleasing to God. And then Messiah will come. So they understand so frequently that the, that the church is going to prepare things and really create the kingdom and just have everything in place for Messiah to come and take a seat. This is not what we see biblically, what the prophets teach. And a, a second point is simply that they are prophesying things are going to get better when the true prophets prophesize things are get very, very difficult and we're called to be overcomers. And a scripture that's so important, I believe it's in Revelation chapter 13, verse seven, either verse seven or eight, it speaks about how the antichrist is going to make war against the saints and overcome them. Now that's a short overcoming. Sure. But what I think about is the cross. See, you can look at the cross. Messiah died. But the cross is also a, an emblem of victory. So just because for a temporary time that we're going to be overcome, and from those who are not looking at it from a scriptural standpoint, it's going to appear as though we're defeated. In the same way that some thought the cross meant that, that Christ was defeated, when in reality the cross was victory mm -hmm. so it's a proper understanding of this process of overcoming and we don't hear a lot about from this so-called prophets movement we don't hear a lot about dying to self taking up your cross and following him it's it goes hand in hand so much with what you spoke of earlier and that that prosperity gospel 
and it goes right back to the text that you you uh, brought up from Second Timothy. It's according to their own desires, and they turn away from from the truth because they're interested in. I, I think in your translation, fables, which is fine. It's the Greek word uh, mythos, where we get the English word myth. Mm -hmm. And a myth is something. If you do a good study of this word, it's a story that produces a desirable outcome. But the problem is what's desirable to the person rather than what's desirable to, to God. Correct. Thank you for that. And to everyone watching, please do not be deceived. This scripture is so relevant for these days. It, it just, the deception just sets up people for not to be prepared for what's coming ahead. So we, uh, we encourage you to read, uh, reach out and just read these scriptures. I want to look at 2 Corinthians now, chapter 11, verse 14, which is a very important one. And no wonder for Satan himself transformed himself into an angel of light. I mean, that's major deception there, which sadly we're seeing quite a lot of now. Well, a messenger or an angel of light, he, he has revelation, but it's not the revelation of God. Mm -hmm. And I think this really puts kind of the definition of what we're talking about. The, these prophets, oh, that they have prophecy, but it's not the prophecy from God. It's a false revelation. It's a revelation that Satan wants to, to fill the earth with, not what, what God is, is wanting his congregation, his servants to hear. You know, when we look at the book of Revelation, one of, of the people that the book of Revelation is addressed is to the prophets. And what it's speaking about there is those that want to hear truth. If you're not interested in the truth, the book of Revelation is going to be very uninterested, uninteresting to people. And that's why one of the books that is leastly taught in the New Testament is the book of Revelation. A book that if you read it, you get blessed. Correct. But people put it aside because it's God's word says it's for people who want to be servants of the truth. And unfortunately, that's rare today. Correct. Uh, the following scripture is one that hopefully we can spend a little bit of time on. We just second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 to 12. Uh, the coming of the lawless one uh, is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth. They did not receive the love of the truth that they may be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Over to you, bro. Well, this is such a foundational scripture. In fact, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is, I, I think, one of the big scriptures, a major chapter that people really need to be studying over and over praying over, over and over, because it's, it's, it's really foundational for the time that we're, we're approaching. But we have, I want to maybe drop down to verse 11. Sure. This is, this is a verse that oftentimes people see this as problematic. They say, wait a second. And did I hear that right? Did, did, did the word of God actually say what, what is written here? Verse 11. And I'm just going to follow the, the translation. It says, and for this reason, that's an important statement, cause and effect. For this reason, God will send them, and your Bible, many of them, in fact, most say strong delusion. The word I want to focus in on first is a word that's translated strong. I have no idea why they would translate it that way. It's the word en ergea, which is where we get the word energy from. It's the word for working, working in, working through, working out. So why it's translated strong here is, is unbeknownst to me, especially when we see that this word appears not just here, but also two other times in this passage. For example, when we look at verse 9, where it says the coming of the lawless one, that's the Antichrist, mm -hmm. 
is according with the working of Satan. Now, this is that same word that's translated strong. Most people don't know that, would never think that because it's so different. Right. But when you, when you look at it in the original language, you see something. What it speaks of, this word for working, says something's going to be done, and that's going to bring an outcome. It works out. It works through, meaning if you put something in, we have that expression, it can come in, and then it kind of works itself through. It, it permeates, and it, it then comes out. So what happens? Well, the scripture is telling us in verse 9, the lawless ones, the Antichrist, he's going to come. He's going to be manifested. And this is all because Satan is at work. He's the cause of it. So Satan works, will manifest the Antichrist. So then you have it here when we go down to verse 11. What God is saying is this. For this reason, and it's speaking about a spiritual law, one that's illustrated throughout the scriptures. It is when we, notice the cause and effect, when we do not believe the truth, when we believe a lie, we are inviting delusion. It works out delusion. It's not that God is sitting back saying, okay, guys, I'm going to send delusion into the world because that's what I like to do. No, it's not saying that he's the source of it. What he's saying is that there's a spiritual law, and that is when one believes a lie, this is false prophecy. When one believes a lie, it works out. There's an outcome. There's a result of that. When I believe a lie, it is going to bring deceit, and it's going to have an impact. And notice something else it says in, in verse, verse 12, where it says, they did not believe the truth. This is a word of rebellion. So the truth is given. I'm convicted that it's true, but I don't believe it. I don't respond to it. I reject it. And what's the reason why I do that? Because I don't have pleasure in righteousness. My pleasure is in unrighteousness. So it's this desire for unrighteousness, my pleasure, that is going to manifest itself when I have that. It is going to bring delusion, deceit, that same word that you spoke of earlier when we began. It's going to bring deceit before us. And because we rejected the truth, it's going to be exactly with what we want to hear, what we want to achieve, and it's going to lead us. So that's the spiritual law. Rebel against the truth. Seek your own desires. You are setting yourself up for deceit. And this is how Satan is using these false prophets. They're telling the people what they want to hear for their own desires that are unrighteous, their rejection of the truth. And this is going to bring about the seat, which is the foundation that's going to bring about the time for the Antichrist to be revealed. Well, wow. amazing. Thank you. Before we get into um, the following scriptures, I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Um, we will show, we're going to do something a little bit different than what we normally do. Um, I have a lot of people coming to me when you try and warn them of uh, certain ministries and churches or prophets or self-proclaimed prophets. Um, they usually tell us or they ask us, no, but there's no proof. There's no evidence that they're doing anything wrong. Um, so we're gonna. I'm gonna show about a 10 minute clip. Um, viewer discretion is advised for those true believers. Um, so I've shown this clip through a couple of believers, and you know they, they struggle getting through it. I think it's important to show this as evidence of some of these ministries that not only may be uh, deceiving people with false prophecy, but also something that I feel is really lacking these days is that genuine fear of the Lord, and they have no respect, uh, no reverence for the Lord or the Holy Spirit, which is an extremely dangerous thing to do and to have. So I'm just going to share a screen now, a different screen, and uh, please bear with us, and um, we will um, take you through this. But secondly, I really want to apologize, sincerely apologize 
for missing the prophecy about Donald Trump. Uh, I prophesied um, that Donald Trump would be president four days after he uh, four days after he uh, took the nomination. Um, the first time, uh, four days after he declared himself a candidate, I should say, the first time, and um, I that was obviously right. And then later on, I prophesied that he would um, not be impeached and the fact that he would win another term. And I was completely wrong. I take full responsibility for being wrong. There's no excuse for it. I, I think it, um, it doesn't make me a false prophet, but it does actually create a credibility gap. And then thinking a little bit about the Spider-Man movie. I think it was Spider-Man two or three where he has, he, this black thing gets on him and he ends up with a black suit. And he realizes that you got, it's a very prophetic movie, actually. I hope, I hope it is. <laughs> hope there's no cussing in it. <laughs> but the, the end of the movie, he realizes that that black thing got on him and grew on him when he was bitter with his friend. And it, they, it depicts him, it, he actually gets it off when he's in a, he's in one of the battles in a church and the bell is ringing. And as the bell's ringing, the thing's coming off of him. What a prophetic movie. When I thought of those angels circling that throne and I thought, I bet they text each other. I bet they have farting contests. That is black. I don't get her off the stage. That is a reverend. Our church building in 2004. And you have to come to Pasadena. You have to come to California to our building. It's called the Ambassador Auditorium. It was valued at $32 million. <coughs> We're talking about the ceiling is covered with 24 karat gold. The wall is pure onyx. In fact, the largest amount of onyx, which is a gemstone, is in our building, the whole Western Hemisphere. If you want to find it, it's not in some mine, but it's in our building. The chandelier is huge. It's worth a million dollars just itself. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And that, this will kind of probably offend you, but oh well. And the Holy Spirit to me is like the genie from Aladdin. I view the Holy Spirit like the genie from Aladdin. And he's blue. Unplanned, perfect. And he's funny. And he's sneaky. Oh, I'm sorry, we have to sit up. Well, two things. I think it's important for you to share the vision of Gandalf, putting the stake down because that. that... Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, okay. So for, for those of you who didn't see the movie, so this happens in the fellowship. In the Fellowship of the Ring. In the Fellowship of the Ring, at some point, Gandalf stands up and he is in the middle of this, this tomb type of place. And the demon that's been holding court there has, has killed everyone, pretty much, that used to live there. It was the dwarves. He's killed them all. And at, when the demon comes after Gandalf, even the demons flee. The demons flee, they start climbing the walls. And out of nowhere, Gandalf realizes the only thing that will stop this demon is if he stands there and confronts it, toe to toe, eye to eye, and tells him, this is the line. And the demon is in full authority, in full manifestation of its presence. It's just roaring in front of Gandalf. And Gandalf stands in his authority in front of the demon and says it the first time he hits it and it doesn't happen. The second time Gandalf does it again and still the demon is not obeying 
And at the third time, Gandalf puts both of his hands on the staff. And he said, I said! And he hits it. I said, Lord, Joe Biden don't need to be president. And just like this, just like if you'd answered me, he said, he won't. Will President Trump, from what God is showing you, win his second term? And yes, it is it's for sure, uh, Sid, that God wants uh, President Trump in. God has already sealed the results of this election. He has sealed it in heaven. Tracy, is President Trump going to have a second term? Well, it's the same thing, similar to Kevin, yes. I want to say without question, Trump is going to win the election. Trump will win. He will be president of the United States. He will sit in that office for four more years, and God will have his way in this country. And strike, 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 and strike until you have victory. For every enemy that is aligned against you, let there be that we would strike the ground, for you will give us victory, God. I hear a sound of abundance of rain. I hear a sound of victory. I hear a sound of shouting and singing. I hear a sound of victory. I hear I hear a sound of an abundance of rain. I hear a sound of victory. I hear a sound of an abundance of rain. I hear a sound of victory. The Lord says it is done. The Lord says it is done. The Lord says it is done. I'm glad to say anything. When I say God, I'm talking about the Father. I always say that. I'm talking about the Father. I know him well, and I mean that seriously. Jesus Christ introduced me to him personally, face to face. I didn't die. <laughs> Number one, there wasn't anything in me that needed to die. I'm a son of God. I speak to this virus. You stop. You cease in your maneuvers against mankind. I command you to stop in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, God's given me authority. God's given me power. Whatever I loose on earth is loose. Whatever I find, I find. I have a right to use this power. Now, coronavirus, you cease right now. You stop right now. I, I go against your spread right now. Now, Lord, we pray and we agree. Because you said when to agree, you'll do it. That this virus will die. It will die. We in the name of Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Standing in the office of the prophet of God, I execute judgment on you, COVID-19. Oh, I execute judgment on you, Satan. You destroyer. You killer. You get out. You break your power. You get off this nation. I demand judgment on you. I demand, I demand, I demand a vaccination to come immediately. Yes. Baruch, before I uh, make some comments, your thoughts, if you have any. Just very sad. <laughs> it's a sign of the times. And what's so unbelievable is that you have disrespect for mm. the Holy Spirit. You have blatantly false prophecy and people kill, follow these individuals, hear what they're saying, put their hope in the man, men, men's words rather than in the word of God. And it just speaks about how we're seeing a falling away, that apostasy and so many people are, are being led away, being drawn away by it, rather than recognizing it for what it is. Correct. And I, and I think it's it's up to a point where I'm no longer angry, but it's quite sad to see all that, you know, how many people are being misled. Um, there, there's no talk about repentance. There's no talk about the cross. Uh, there's none of that talk. It's, it's all these false prophecies and what can God do for me now, which is, which is quite sad. I'm now going to share the screen again and just return to scripture um, where I would like to uh, look at um, Deuteronomy, um, specifically 13. 
So we'll get to that scripture very quickly. And interesting what the Lord had to say about false prophecies and prophets in the Old Testament. So I'm just going to read this very quickly. Deuteronomy 13 verses 1 to 5. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love your Lord, the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God. I'll just hand over to you, Baruch. Well, I'll tell you what surprises me. It is that these prophecies that people gave turn out to be blatantly false. That surprises me because I thought they might be true. And what I mean by that is this. This passage from Deuteronomy 13 says there's a false prophet that comes. He gives a sign. He says a dream that he has, and it comes true. So there seems to be a confirmation, mm. but yet because this one is not rooted in truth, what he's saying is turn away. You should know that he's a false prophet, even though his false prophecy came with signs and wonders with confirmation. To me, the fact that in our, our age, these false prophets come and they're blatantly shown to be false just says how weak the church is, that, that God wants it to be so clear to us that these are false men, false women. I mean, in one of the quotes you had, there was a woman saying, and this just shows the root of, of herself in pride. When she says, there's nothing in me that needs to die. Right. Wow. I can tell you there's lots of things in my life that needs to die. There's things that God's working on. And you know what else? As, as soon as I have a, a victory in one area, God usually shows me three or four additional areas that I wasn't aware of that he's displeased with. Mm. We're, we're, he's working. He's, he's changing us. He's showing more and more those things that need to die in, in our lives. We need to bring every thought captive to the obedience. So when a person says, there's nothing in me that needs to die, I, I, the, the, the pride in that statement, the, the, the blindness in that statement is so informative. And then that, that quote from Paula White, if I'm not mistaken, and, and here's multiple marriages, mm -hmm. uh, it's so obvious the Charlington, Charlington the, the, the deception, the falsehood, the blatant, blatant disregard for, for that which is of modesty, that which represents what the Bible says a, a woman should be. This, this individual flaunts the exact opposite. And here she is, I believe, on election night saying, I hear victory. I hear victory in all of this. And she didn't. You know, what they were doing was they looked at the initial returns and it looked good. <laughs> and so they were basing their prophecy on what they, they thought that was going to be carried out. But again, Deuteronomy 13, it says that the false prophet, that dreamer of dreams, he says something true. So what? doesn't matter if it's a company with signs and wonders. If it's not based in the word of God, we need to recognize that one who gives seemingly acts of power, miracles, is false. Correct. Thank you. And I think that we're going to be looking at some scriptures on what we should be doing or be focusing on so that we don't get deceived. But before we start looking at these, of course, I think the most important thing is, you've touched on this a couple of times, Baruch, just in today's discussion, is go to the word of God. Go to the scriptures, the authority of the scriptures, the truth of scripture. You don't need a prophet, a so-called prophet, to tell you what's going to happen. It's all right there in the Bible. So that, I'm sure you would agree, Baruch, is the most important thing 
that we should be doing at these days, at these end times, to avoid deception. However, we're going to now look at some other scriptures. Um, I think it's important we, we can just touch on 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 first, that uh, it reads, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. If you can just touch on that, bro. This is a the judgment seat of, of Christ, that word in Greek, bima, which is really of a Hebrew origin. It speaks about a judgment of rewards, that God's going to evaluate everything that we do, those things that, that do not stand the, the test of a, a fire, meaning if it can't be refined, it's going to be done away with, no more will suffer loss. Mm -hmm. Those things that are of, of God, it's going to even be refined. What we have done, it's going to be a great source of reward. So the judgment seat has to do with our ministry. It's not for the purpose of salvation. That's not the purpose of, of that passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It is a, a judgment for believers of rewards. What rewards are we going to receive? And only those that are built upon truth on the proper foundation. Those that are not are going to be dealt with like, like wood and straw and, and, and grass that fire touches it and it just dissolves it instant, instantly. So it's thinking about having a lifestyle that produces good fruit that God refines and turns into eternal kingdom blessings. Thank you. I think now what we've mentioned previously, what to do, what to focus on in addition to God's word, I want to touch on uh, scripture in First John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Right there you have it, the connection between false prophets and, and prophets. And this is something that we should be looking for. So someone, if we are approaching the last days, we should be saying, okay, there's going to be this deception. There's going to be false prophets. And lo and behold, just here recently, we have this new movement that speaks about prophets and such, and this emphasis in a, a part of the body of, of, of Christ within, within the, the church at large. So it's, it's very, uh, what we're seeing shouldn't surprise us. Mm -hmm. And we're commanded to do just that to realize that not every manifestation, spiritual manifestation, is from God. Correct. Do not believe every spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Next scripture, James 1.5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Wisdom. What, what, where does, what, what's connected with wisdom, according to the book of Proverbs, the fear, fear of the Lord. And, and this, to me, is really foundational. You should, you should evaluate who you're sitting under, whether it's someone that you, you listen to on, on the Internet, in your local congregation, the, the leader. Is this someone that demonstrates by his lifestyle, by the decisions he makes, is this someone who, who demonstrates a fear, a respect, a sensitivity, a sensitivity to the fact that, that God is God, that, that he is Lord. So, or whether it's someone who kind of flaunts before God. And this is this, this relationship of pride. So many of those that are in that movement of, of modern day prophets, modern day apostles, when you listen, you see so much emphasis on, on pride, on the person. And that's why they were, were, were brought into it, because it was pride that got, that got them to, to be deceived. So wisdom is, is related to the fear of the Lord, submitting to the Lord, and being committed to the things of the Lord. Not my life, my wants, my desires. Thank you. The last scripture we want to touch on is in Romans 12, verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Very powerful scripture about not being conformed to this world, but look at eternal things, not things of this world that a lot of these false prophets and teachers falsely teach. So I just brought it over to you. But one thing, and uh, we have a radio show called Lost in Translation because things are lost in translation. If you look here, it says, do not be conformed by, by the world. The world shouldn't be the influence, but rather the kingdom should be the influence of our life. And it says, be transformed. So we should be in the process of changing. That's why dying to self, that's so important. Be transformed. And what you have here is a failure to really understand the parts of speech. Because if you look here, it says, by the renewing of your mind. It doesn't say that in the original language. It doesn't say renewing, but we have an adjective, the renewed mind. So it's not my mind going through a process of renewal, but rather it's, it's being transformed by the renewed mind. And I believe that that is a reference to the mind of Christ. So it's not that I go through a process, but it goes to dying to self, having my mind, my desires, my objectives being removed and replaced with the mind of Christ. And that's something that each of us should pray constantly, that we're operating, submitting to the mind of, of Christ, that, that he is leading us, that it's his perspective that we are submitting to, that it's his perspective that gives us the vision, that gives us the direction for our life. Not thinking that, that well, he wants to give me the desires of my heart. Here again, a wrong understanding. Mm -hmm. What it says is that God will give to you your desires in your heart. He's going to put there the right desires. Why? He's going to replace my selfish desires. He's going to put his desires, what he wants there. It's not saying that what I desire that God's going to give me. And one last thing you, you made uh, mention of it. And I believe it's in Matthew chapter eight, where it says, or maybe one of the people in the video was mentioning it, where it says, where two or three are gathered together, whatever they ask in my name, we have that whatever. But in a recent teaching, we're going through the book of Matthew. The word here is pantos paragmatos. We, we know the English word pragmatic. Now, in Greek, that which is pragmatic is that which is investigated thoroughly for a good outcome. So what it's saying here is not if Christian, if you and I get together and we agree on things, let's agree that, that we're both going to get a Rolls Royce. We agree on that in the name of Christ. And are we going to get that? I, I don't think so. No. Because the scripture is saying when two or three come together and they thoroughly research, thoroughly investigate, what is God's will in this situation? What is proper? If we can, if we're both in agreement, what is after thoroughly seeking the mind of Christ and we pray God's going to respond? Why? It says not that it will be, but it uses the phrase in the perfect meaning, God, it was in the past, present, and the future. What he's saying is we're agreeing with God. It's not God agreeing with us. That's heresy. That's idolatry. It's us with discernment, the fear of the Lord, with that renewed mind, discovering what is God's will and praying in the will of God for the will of God, not trying to get something that we want, but us being part of what God wants. That's a big difference. It is a very big difference. And uh, I'm just going to stop sharing the screen now. I'm, I'm glad you touched on those two scriptures because that's two of the biggest scriptures that the prosperity gospel uh, teachers tend to use the most. So thank you for clarifying that. It, it certainly adds a very clear perspective of what the word of God really says. So uh, to everyone watching, please understand our hearts, see our hearts. It, it's not about us judging others or anything like that. It's about bringing into light uh, the deception that currently is uh, basically increasing all around the world with a lot of these false ministries. So uh, from my perspective, it's just 
a, a recommendation just to spend more time in the word. And like Baruch touched on, find, uh, if you don't, already don't have one, of course, find a church where the word of God is the basis for everything, where, uh, you know, you, you have that discernment where people ask for wisdom for, um, they test every spirit to make sure it is really from the Holy Spirit. And to get away from people that have pride or that are trying to sell books or that are trying to put fear in people's hearts with false agendas. So that's from my perspective. We, we're hoping that you've got something out of this. Uh, I think every time you look at the word of God, of course, uh, everyone benefits from it. But just for your closing comments, Baruch, over to you. Well, we want to be people that study to show ourselves approved. That means approved from God's point of view. We want to be people that agree with God in order that his will, that we can have the privilege of participating in the things that please him, that manifest his character, that, that's in keeping with righteousness so the glory of God is manifested. That's what we want to do. And the greatest tool is the word of God and, of course, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And the anointing manifests itself most, most frequently when there is a, a respect and a proper utilizing of, of scriptural truth. Amen. So, folks, also at the end of this um, discussion, you will have uh, once again on the screen where you can write to us some comments and questions. I would like to acknowledge quite a few people that have written to us uh, for probably three or four of the last discussions that we've had. We've had wonderful feedback, some great questions, some great comments as well. And we will always encourage that. But um, we, we pray, I pray specifically, you've been blessed with this. I pray that the Lord will give you revelation and wisdom uh, moving forward and to spend more and more time in the word. And uh, like Ruth said, with the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the leading and the guiding and the counsel of the Holy Spirit. Baruch, I'd like to thank you once again, as usual, for uh, your time and for shedding your views on such important and relevant scriptures that are very much in need in the world today. So thank you, Baruch. Thank you, Christian, for organizing this and uh, your time and effort and technology and putting this together so that uh, people can at least be, be confronted with these things and and hopefully the Spirit of God will lead them exactly where, where God wants them to be, in that right mindset. Thank you. So everyone watching, we hope you'll join us uh, for another future, future discussion. We hope you've been blessed. And once again, thank you. And shalom. Thank you.